me start like this. I, uh, I want you to imagine you're a smoker. And you've smoked for a long time, okay? You've smoked for 30 years. And back in the day when you started smoking, a friend told you that you should quit. And well, you told them, okay, okay, one day, eventually I'll quit. And now 30 years have passed. You've just walked out of your doctors. Turns out you have lung cancer. And so you finally quit smoking. Wise choice, right? But the problem is you've already got cancer. You know, it doesn't help to just quit smoking once you've already got cancer. You need an intervention. You need to intervene in the process of cancer spreading around because it, because it has already started to do so. It's quite a heavy story, right? I mean, lung cancer is obviously a, a terrible thing, but it speaks to the situation where we are today. 30 years ago, they told, uh, told us, or, well, not me, but most people, that we need to eventually stop emitting carbon dioxide and methane into the atmosphere, or else, you know. And, well, we didn't. Now the else is happening. So we should start looking at some interventions. So let's look at what's happening in the Arctic. High up there in the north, we have this vast area of water called the Arctic Ocean. And the Arctic Ocean is covered with sea ice, which is this sun-blocking shield. Now, the Arctic is as it is because of the sea ice, because part of the Arctic remains frozen from winter to summer to winter year-round. And the sea ice reflects sunlight and keeps the area cold. And it also provides a living environment and hunting ground for many. And it also keeps the area less politically tensioned. Now, a big part of us humans have, in the past some decades, put so many gases up into the atmosphere that the year-round sea ice will be lost. That means that, we, that the area will have no ice at the end of summer, and that all of the old year-round sea ice will be lost. Some say this will happen quite soon, some will say sooner. And the important thing is, this will happen even if we cut emissions rapidly. So even if we would cut emissions the fastest way, which we definitely should be doing, we would still see the so-called blue ocean event, the Arctic Sea with no ice. So what does this mean? It means two things. It means that we are facing an Arctic climate catastrophe. And it means that simply cutting emissions won't save us from this. Which means that we should be looking for and developing additional ways to stop this. Which we are not doing right now on the scale and pace that would give us a good chance of preventing this from happening. And that's down to us. The civil society, government actors, and the private sector, they're not taking action. They're not even giving an opinion about saving the Arctic sea ice. Because we don't have the courage to touch the trickiest issues. So what happens when we lose the summer sea ice? The Arctic heats, heats up more and faster. Less sea ice, more carbon-absorbing dark seawater, more heat. Less snow around the Arctic, more heat. As the sea ice evaporate, evaporates, the local greenhouse effect becomes even stronger. More heat, and so on. They call it Arctic amplification. The Arctic heating has global effects. Permafrost, and I mean the permanently frozen land, will melt. As the ground collapses, people's houses are washed into the ocean. Same with roads, infrastructure. And as the sea ice weakens, the food providing north water per linear between Greenland and Canada is under threat. The indigenous peoples are, as ever so often, on the front lines of these impacts. And that's why the Arctic indigenous peoples should have the biggest say in what we will try to do about Arctic amplification. Arctic heating changes the Arctic. It raises sea levels and threatens coastal cities. It also 
creates more extreme weather, which allows more heat up to the Arctic. So you have this vicious cycle. And it doesn't end there. No matter what we do with our emissions, we are also already past the 1.5 degrees threshold. And then there's the bad news. 1.5 degrees happens to be the tipping point for four major Earth system elements. The Greenland ice sheet, the West Antarctic ice sheet, the tropical coral reefs, and the abrupt thaw of the boreal permafrost. Beyond 1.5 degrees, it becomes likely that all of these systems will start collapsing. So 1.5 is gone, safety for the major ice sheets is gone, and the Arctic summer sea ice will be gone, even if we cut emissions rapidly. So, what's the plan? Let me stress this, a lot of damage is already unavoidable with only emission cuts. And while we must cut emissions rapidly, we must do so, we must also ask ourselves, is it enough? In, in our society, we have this old climate paradigm. And this old paradigm says, it is enough. The old paradigm says, let's cut emissions and hope for the best. In this old paradigm, we don't really take any responsibility for preventing any specific changes or collapses. The old paradigm doesn't state which ecosystems are essential and to whom. It doesn't state which things we cannot afford to lose, which things we hold dear, which things we love the most. And this old paradigm dominates our society, from us, the climate movement, to government, to business, and to be frank, large parts of academia as well. So, bring down emissions, hope for the best, adapt to the rest, if possible. A huge level of damage, death and sorrow already accepted. You know, the, the white flag's already flying. The old paradigm was born 30 years ago. Now imagine we would now create a new paradigm from scratch today. Imagine if, if we as humanity had just found out that temperatures are rising and that it's caused by emissions we would learn that the Arctic uh, climate system is collapsing. We would learn that the tropical coral reefs uh, are toast. We would learn that we are way, going way past any temperature limit that could be described as safe. What strategies would we be discussing? Would we, on the highest levels and in the public, be discussing things like, how could we still save the Arctic sea ice? Is there any way to hold sea level rise? Is there any way that we could still restore those coral reefs? We would, but we aren't. Because we're stuck in the past, we're struggling to hold on to that old story, the story in which the immense level of suffering is unavoidable. Stuck with what we in Operati Arctis' recent publication, Arctic Endgame, call politics of accepted victims. The old paradigm was born 30 years ago. This brings us back to the story about lung cancer. Once the collapse has already started, you might just consider medication, even a risky intervention, because the other option is assured disaster. The old paradigm was born 30 years ago, and it doesn't accept climate intervention. The reality has since changed. The new paradigm is rooted in the realization that emission mitigation didn't go as it should have gone. There's already too much carbon in the atmosphere, already too much heat in the oceans. Now, the new paradigm is about climate repair. 
Climate repair means repairing the climate. It means reversing and minimizing the damage that's already underway, regardless of emission cuts. It's about not giving up, not accepting the damage. It's about intervening in the process of deterioration and collapse. Climate repair is about zeroing emissions, but it's also about removing greenhouse gases from the atmosphere and repairing and providing active support for the parts of Earth that are already breaking apart. And there are potential techniques for this, climate interventions. Techniques that make the Earth more reflective, techniques that uh, increase the carbon uptake of the biomass, techniques that support the glaciers, brightening uh, marine clouds with sea salt, uh, adding aerosols into the upper atmosphere, increasing nutrients in the high seas, installing, uh, installing truck structures to prevent warmer water from intruding the underside of ice sheet glaciers. But let me be clear, they involve risks too. And we need to take those risks very seriously. Just as the risks that we are dealing with on this current trajectory. It's yet to be proven whether these techniques or some of them work for the better rather than for the worse. But there is a chance for climate repair, and it's quite a promising one. Now, people often reject the idea of climate repair on the grounds that it may lower motivation for emission cuts. And yes, there is a risk. And we should be figuring out ways to, for example, tie together uh, climate repair with specifically emission targets. And also, the risk is not certain. Climate repair could also help us bring down emissions faster. Climate repair could help um, us prevent climate-connected crises. And those crises always take the attention of governments and societies from longer-term goals like cutting emissions to day-to-day -day survival. Climate repair could um, help us support uh, the gl glaciers and halt sea level rise so that governments can uh, concentrate on building carbon-free infrastructure instead of flood walls and pumping systems or even relocating entire cities or nations. Climate repair could also help us protect our forests from the terrible wildfires that are caused by overheating. So you really cannot know which will happen. And our job is to imagine, to be open to new possible routes, because a lot of it is in our hands. Comparing the risks requires a clear picture of the risks and, of course, the benefits. And for that, we need a lot more research. Now, the thing is, we have limited time to make decisions on whether to pursue climate repair or not. So we have to discuss it right now. That's because the climate system is non-linear, meaning that beyond certain points, the changes accelerate. They become self-sustaining. Think about a ball. <laughs> I put a ball up here. You're kicking a ball on top of a hill. Now you kick the ball and it rolls and it stops. And now you kick the ball again and the ball reaches the point where the hilltop turns into a slope. So now you've kicked the ball hard enough so it's going to go down whether you kick it again or not. So either you catch the ball or it's down the hill. You can't unroll the ball anymore. You need to run for the ball. And that's the, sit sis, uh, the situation with these Earth system elements right now. They're reaching the slope and they're going to go down unless we stop them. They're crossing their tipping points, no matter if the global temperatures stabilize. So, we know staying under 1.5 is not possible without climate intervention. We know the Arctic sea ice will be lost without climate intervention. And we know that the Greenland ice sheet and the West Antarctic ice sheet will cross their tipping points beyond 1.5 degrees. That is, without climate repair. So what do we do? What's the plan? Will we try to catch the ball or not? If we are to catch the ball, we need common research questions and goals. We need teams trying together to figure out how to stop these collapses from happening. We need a lot of political will and willpower 
and financing. We need all of the sectors of our society taking part in this, just like in emission mitigation. All hands on deck. And we need open and equitable decision-making and governance. Everybody needs to be aware of this, and everybody needs to have a chance to take part in this discussion, to have a say on what trajectory we want to put ourselves on. We must not give up. We must not descend into defeat. There's still a chance for climate repair. And uh, as a 22-year-old as a who has become very familiar with the bleak future we're looking at on this trajectory, but also as someone who truly sees the chance that is this new paradigm, I just want to tell you, this is not the time for giving up. This is not the time. We must examine and investigate the ways for climate repair. We must adapt the new paradigm, even if it leads us to rejecting climate repair, rejecting climate intervention techniques. Because that's the thing. Even to that conclusion, we must arrive through a new paradigm, not by just accepting the damage that's already unavoidable without climate repair. We owe it to ourselves, and we owe it to the young people, and we owe it to the communities on the climate front lines to ask ourselves, are we truly ready to accept the damage that's unavoidable without climate repair? Or will we give climate repair a chance? Thank you. <laughs>